I would now ask Alan Reid, the Liberal Democratic candidate, to lead off this hosting meeting. You have two minutes, and I will tell you when you have 15 seconds left. Alan Reid, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all very much for coming out to listen to us all this lovely sunny afternoon. I'm proud of what Liberal Democrats have achieved in government. We have a rapidly growing economy. Here in Argyland Butte, 500 more jobs over the past year. Income tax has been cut by £800 for workers on low and middle earnings. The triple lock guarantee for pensioners saw a pension increase in the, a increase in the state pension, double the rate of inflation this year. The budget deficit cut in half. And very importantly, Liberal Democrats have put the Highlands and Islands at the heart of government after decades of neglect. As a result, we've seen the island fuel duty discount. Every time you fill up your car at the pumps in Butte, you pay five pence a litre less tax than people in the mainland do. The rollout of superfast broadband and 4G mobile phone coverage is well underway. The Coastal Communities Fund is returning 50% of the profits of the Crown Estate back to communities in the Highlands and Islands. In the budget, we saw an announcement of £30 of electricity bills in the Highlands and Islands. And make no mistake, that happened because Liberal Democrats were in government. In the nine years that I sat on the opposition benches, the Labour government just brushed aside all the pleas that we made for help for the Highlands and Islands. The last five years, the tables were turned, and I was listening to Labour MPs on the opposition benches mourning that Highlands and Islands Liberal Democrat MPs were feathering our own nests. I'm proud of being accused of delivering benefits to my constituency. That's what I was elected to do. My focus during my time at Westminster has been on delivering for our dial in Butte. That's my only aim. I'm not some party automaton that takes the orders from above. I, I usually vote in favour of what the Liberal Democrat policy is because I agree with nearly seconds. all of it. But when proposals are put forward that I disagree with, such as an increase in fuel duty, uni increase in university tuition fees or the bedroom tax, then I vote against it. Thank Liberal you, Mr Reid. Number two in the order of drawing the lot was Mary Gobraith, representing the Labour Party. Mary, please. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's great to be here on a good day. I'm sure some of us would rather be outside, but thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to us. I believe that Argyll and Butte deserves better. It deserves better representation and better government. Too often it feels like we're a forgotten backwater, and too often we're on the wrong end of bad decisions. And we now have a choice in front of us. There are two futures facing this country, either five more years of the Conservatives or a Labour government. And the Labour Party has a plan for a better future, a future that says the country will be successful when we're all successful, when individuals and families succeed, so does the country. Our policies and what we are offering are focused on everyone in this room and what will make your lives better to help the country as a whole. And I want to highlight some of the policies I'm very passionate about because I think they're as relevant in Butte as they are anywhere else in the country. We're proposing a minimum wage going up to at least £8 by the end of this Parliament and certainly by, a, by October 2019 working towards a living wage, security in work with an end to zero hours contracts that exploit people when big corporations now put people in zero hours contracts that can't continue. We'd finally bin the bedroom tax historically to the bin in every part of the UK. A job guarantee for long-term unemployed. A future fund for school leavers that will give £1,600 to young people that don't go to college or university to help them get driving lessons, set up in business, buy tools to kickstart their careers. 15 seconds. We'd freeze energy bills starting this winter, double paternity leave, a new 10p starting rate of tax and a higher a 50 pence rate at the top. Our plans will help all families succeed to help the country succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Number three on the list, Brendan O'Hara representing the SNP. Good afternoon and again thank you for coming out on such a, a beautiful afternoon. I, I hope you find it worthwhile. Can I say right at the beginning 
This general election is not a rerun of the referendum, but it is one of the most important general elections in Scotland's history because this will decide where we as a country go for the next 5, 10, 15 years. It's that important. We've got to decide whether we lead or whether it's business as usual. And that's the choice that's facing you on May the 7th. There are four main planks to our campaign. Delivery of the vow that was promised to Scotland in September by all of the opposition parties and the UK government. An end to austerity. The non-renewal of Trident and the securing a better deal for Argyll and Butte. We were promised in September with a no vote that we would get, I quote, as close to federalism as is possible. You've got to decide who you trust best to deliver that vow. And I would argue most strongly that it's the Scottish National Party who are best placed to deliver more powers to our parliament. We've had five years of austerity, which as it's designed to do, has hurt the poorest in our communities hardest. It has to end. Yet they tell you they all have 100,000 million pounds to renew weapons of mass destruction in the Trident missiles programme. It's morally wrong, it's economically insane, and seconds. it is militarily useless. We need a better future for Argyll and Butte. We need a better future for Scotland. The SNP can deliver a breath of fresh air into United Kingdom politics, Thank you, having Mr. led so well in Scotland since 2007. Thank, Thank you. you. Number four, Alistair Redmond, who is representing the Conservative Party. Alistair Redmond, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Brute, Butte and Rothsay, for turning up on what is a fabulous day, and hopefully we'll see many more of them. Ever since the referendum, I've been amazed at how many people are turning out to these hustings, and it's a welcome sign for our democracy. It's good to see people engaged. It's a great thing. Why I think I'd be your best choice for MP in Argyll and Butte? Well, Butte is not the same as Isla. It'd be wrong to say. But I am from an island community. I know what it's like when the ferries don't come in and the shells become empty. I know what it's like with roaming charges, those god-awful roaming charges that put you at the 1922 partition every time you walk down a street. I know what it's like when broadband's too slow and when politicians of all banners in the central belt talk about increasing overall roaming and increasing overall internet speed. I think it's unacceptable. I am from a rural background. My father's a crofter. My brother Tom is a fisherman, and my mom's a nurse. I know what it's like to be both in a rural area and myself from a poorer background. I left high school at the age 16. I then went to work on a local farm. I then took over the local post office at 17. I've built up a small business that is prosperous, but small, on the island of Isla. So I know all too well the issues facing you. Now, do you want to see a continued constitutional merry-go-round, or do you want to see real change here in Argyll and Butte? Change for the better. I think it's time that we had someone from the islands and for the islands representing you. Our farmers are being ignored. Our dairy farmers right here on Butte face a real crisis, and that cannot be ignored by central belt-obsessed governments. Seconds. So please, vote for me as your candidate for the right kind of change here on Butte and in Argyll and Butte. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's thank you. It's nice to see such a, a big turnout. And could I just say something else? Uh, an apology from Caroline Santos, the UKIP representative who called off earlier today. Um, and also, I have no idea, and the candidates have no idea what the questions are going to be. And we purposely do this so that there can be no accusations of it's a fix or we know the questions, so therefore we can give you the answers. The candidates have no idea what the questions are going to be. They're your questions, and I'll take the first one now and let you know that there is a, a roving mic. If you want to speak, put your hand up, and uh, we'll try and spread it out throughout the audience. Um, 
throughout the afternoon. Douglas Lyle's going round with the microphone, and he'll hang on to the microphone, but make it available for you to speak. A lady in the front here with the stripe top on. The microphone will come to you. You hold it, okay. Um, my question is about democracy. Um, what, are, what are the candidates' definition of democracy, given the amount of leafleting that we've had on tactical voting? And I'd like to know what their position is on that. They want to know what democracy is. Is that the, the basis of your question? You want to know what democracy is. Sorry? What they think, what they think democracy is, right. Can I, can we'll start I? off with uh, Mary Galbraith. Okay. I believe that democracy is when people feel that they're in charge, when that they can influence the results, when they can hold politicians to account. There are many, as the Greeks who, who came up with it would tell you, there are many different aspects to it and many different forms of it. There are some very attractive ones. O to ostracize somebody is the process that the Greeks invented where every year they picked one of the 10 senators that, or, or 10 representatives they had and they said, you, you're off. And so it's a, a, it's a bit like the X factor. It's when you eliminate the one you, you, you least like. So there are all different forms. I think for us here, I think the choice for Argyll and Butte is about choosing the person that can best represent Argyll and Butte. I think it's as simple as that. And that the form we have here is that the party with the most seats uh, forms the government. That has been a case which delivers rough justice. Most systems of democracy do have a bit of rough justice. In the Scottish Parliament, we currently have a majority SNP Parliament, but it didn't get a majority of the votes. That's just the way it happens. You've had that way in Westminster for years. All systems will deliver a bit of rough justice at times. There are questions about how, how long and how sur survivable those systems are. But I think here, you pick the person you want to elect uh, to represent you here. Thanks. Alistair Redmond, please. Yes, well, what I would say is, if anyone could run on the tactical vote, it's myself, if I chose to. All the pan-unionist groups back conservatives to keep the nationalists out in this seat. However, I come at it from a different perspective. I believe you should vote for what you believe in. I believe that if you send a leaflet out, and at least half of it is talking about nothing but horses or two-horse races and not enough about broadband or roads, I think that's a time when people see the right kind of change. Now, we are a voice for change right here in Argyll and Butte. And I have support, particularly on the islands, but also on the mainland, from both yes and no supporters. I have support from unionists under the Labour banner, Lib Dem, you name it. There's a grand sort of notion in the Lib Dem leaflets that there's this huge unionist coalition rallying behind the Lib Dem candidate. Well, that's just simply not true. You see more conservative activists than you do any of the other unionist parties. We are the real party positioned to beat the nationalists. That said, if you're a yes or a no voter, I want you to back us here in Butte. I'll go to the audience. What do you think of the answer so far? Anyone? Questioner? Could you speak up? Well, the microphone will come, but if you could speak up. I just think you get hit with so much time voting and all the Yeah. Alan Reid, please. Well, I see a democracy is giving uh, the, the people of the country the right to elect their elected representatives in a fair way. And in Scotland, for the Scottish Parliament elections, for council elections, we have true democracy because they are based, the, the elections to the parliament, to the council, are based on proportional, re, proportional representation. So people can go out and vote for the candidate or the party they believe in, knowing that their votes will be reflected in the number of elected representatives in the parliament or the council. But at old-fashioned Westminster, we still have this ancient, discredited system of first-past-the-post. And the problem with the first-past-the-post system is that the number of votes cast for parties are not reflected in the number of votes, that, the number of seats that those parties get in Parliament. For example, in most of the national opinion polls at the moment, the Labour Party are, in Scotland are getting about 25% of the vote. Yet all the predictions are that they'll get about maybe one or maybe two seats. That, that, 
that, that is simply unfair. Now, the other, the other aspect of first-past-the-post is what first-past-the-post does is force tactical voting on people. If you look in the country as a, if you look at Britain as a whole, the most marginal seats are Labour Conservative marginals. And if, if you were living in a Labour Conservative marginal, you would get leaflets from the Conservative Party and from the Labour Party telling you that a vote for any other candidate was a wasted vote. Now, I don't like the concept of a wasted vote, but the first-past-the-post system forces that concept on us. And you, if you want your vote to, you, you really, if you're if your first choice is a candidate who has no chance in your seat, you have two choices. You can record a vote for that candidate knowing that your vote will not count in the election. Or you can, cast, or you can look at see who is in, in, in with a chance of winning this seat, and you can cast your vote for one of those two uh, candidates. Now, clearly, as the incumbent MP for 14 years, I'm in with a serious chance of winning this seat. According to the national opinion polls, Brendan is in with a serious chance of winning this seat. I do not see the Labour and Conservative as in with much a chance of winning this seat. But in Tory Labour marginals up and down the country, Labour and Tory are campaigning for people to vote tactically. So I say to you, hoist them on their own petard and vote in this election for one of the two candidates who's in with a chance of winning the seat. That's myself or Brendan. Thank you. Brendan O'Hara, please. Uh, I would say that uh, I'll answer the point about tactical voting. I think we've covered democracy. Tactical voting has happened in Scotland organically for decades. Scotland, since Mrs Thatcher was elected, has voted tactically to keep the Tories out. Where it becomes, I think, slightly desperate is where political parties actively campaign for a tactical vote. People aren't stupid. People know how to vote tactically. We've been doing it for, as I say, we've been doing it for decades. And we have, you know, I've had numerous communications with Alan through my, my postman, who must be a, a, the strongest postman in Scotland now, the, <laughs> the number of uh, electoral communications I've had saying, you know, vote tactically to keep the SNP out. If people want to keep the SNP out, people will know what to do. They don't have to be encouraged to do it. I would encourage people vote for what they want rather than what they, they don't want. I think we are in a, a new political era in Scotland. It's an era of hope. It's an era of optimism. It's an era where people, I believe, for the first time in a long, long time, believe that their voice counts. So I would say, make your voice count. Vote for the person that you want to represent you as opposed to the person that you don't want to represent you. Any, any views from the audience on what you've heard? The, the microphone will come. Um, through the chair, could I ask um, if you could have each of the candidates to uh, give their opinion on the unelected upper house that we have in Westminster? I, I suppose that is linked to the demo democratic question. Um, very briefly, and I'll start at the far end, Alan, what, what do you have? It should be replaced with an elected upper house. I mean, unelected uh, politicians have no place in our democracy. Yep. Mary? I would agree with that, and we've put forward in our manifesto a, a process to replace it with an elected uh, Senate of the nations and regions, for want of a better term. However, that process... We all need to work together on that process to decide what it would look like, how we would have a, a revising chamber, which I think is a really important process, to have a second chamber that acts as a check and balance to the, to the primary one, um, is something that everybody needs to be involved in. It's not something that needs to be a carve-up behind the scenes, but it should absolutely be elected. Thank you. Alistair Redman? There's no doubt we need to reform the House of Lords. Where it becomes interesting here to hear from both Labour and the Lib Dems on this is the Lords are packed full of Labour and Lib Dems. In fact, uh, Mr. Reid will <laughs> uh, in, in, in be heading there very soon, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it needs to be reformed, absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Brendan? In, I don't need to in, in a up, sentence, it's, a, it's an anti-democratic throwback. And the, the rocks would melt with the sun, as someone famously said before I 
would ever set foot in it, or I would ever expect a Scottish National Party member to set foot in that place. Everyone's talked about reforming the House of Lords for years. They talk big when they're out of power, and they do hee-haw when they're in power. And I think that speaks volumes for it. Feathering one's nest, perhaps, would be a cynical look at it. I'd, I'd like to come back on that point. Labour has in recent years made commitments to reform and we have reformed. We did get rid of the uh, a large swathe of the inherited, uh, the, the, the peerages that were inherited and reduced the size of the House of Lords. So there has been progressive reform, not nearly enough for my taste. But to say, as Brendan said, that hee-haw has been done is not true. A lot you has been done, but there's a lot more to do. You have a fundamentally anti-democratic House of Lords, but you had 13 years in power and you tinkered at the edges. If you, if you had a commitment to democracy across the United Kingdom, it would have been one of the first things that you did. You tinkered at the edges and it is, remains as anti-democratic or as undemocratic as it was in 1997 as it is now. Coming. Brendan, you've just changed your tune there in the space of two minutes. Initially you said we'd done nothing, now you're saying we tinkered at the edges. Wholly inconsistent. The fact is, we did, we did make changes. Jack Straw had many plans for much bigger changes, which in the end didn't materialise. You had three terms of an overall majority. And I'll tell you what, Mary, if, if you can honestly, with hand on heart, flag up that you're proud of what Labour did in reforming the House of Lords, then I'd be astonished. No, I'm, I'm challenging you on your statements, Brendan, because you said initially we had done nothing. Then you conceded that we had done something. And I said uh, to the gentleman who asked the question, we need to get rid of the unelected House of Lords. Okay, it needs to be okay, an elected Mary, chamber. What, what I'll say is, you didn't do hee-haw, you did haw. <laughs> Just as a point, as a point of interest, is there anyone in the audience who thinks the House of Lords is a good thing? The microphone away over here, Douglas, please. <laughs> Lady in the pink. I think it has a stabilizing position to, uh, oh gosh, um, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's good that if the government isn't doing its job, they can have a steadying influence. Um, yeah, I, I really don't think that's in dispute. I think the fact that they're unelected is, is what's in dispute. Well, forgive me, your, your question was, does anyone here support the House of Lords? I mean, you have to have an upper house. Whether it's elected or appointed, that would be the question. Yeah. So I think that's what the lady was referring to. The Scottish Government doesn't have a, an overriding extra parliament, extra, extra house. Yeah, but we're talking about the, the Westminster election, not the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, I know. Okay. There's a lady here who would like to say something. Uh, well, I do support the fact that there is um, a, a second chamber at yeah. the House of Lords. I think it's a very good revising chamber for legislation. There are people there who are crossbenchers, um, you know, who aren't necessarily politically minded, but are there because they're experts in their field and have been uh, co-opted or nominated to be part of that. Now, whether it's going to be better if it's elected or not, I don't know, but the question simply was, is there anyone who supports the existence yeah. of the House of yeah. Lords? And I certainly do for the legal um, element that it does um, revise legislation with people who have time to sit and do it for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, I mean, the, the I question feel, was, do you support the upper house? Yeah. I think we'll move on. Over here. In front of the camera. You couldn't get them any further apart, could you? Keep me fit. Are you coming to me? Question, please. Hello, question to the lady in red. You said Labour would 
in 2019 put the minimum wage up to eight pounds. Yep. It needs to go up now to eight pounds because by the time it comes to 2019, mm. we'll be in the same position because it'll only be worth 641, which they're getting paid at the moment. Now you would change something if you really wanted to do it. So I don't think you really want to do it. The minimum okay. wage, Mary. I. I'm proud of the fact that Labour brought in the minimum wage when our opponents, many of them, said it would finish up, it would finish so many businesses, and it didn't. We had a big battle to get it accepted and to get it established. We have since then had independent groups that recommended what it should be, uh, that, in, that was a sustainable minimum wage that meant that our companies, our businesses that need to pay it aren't suddenly completely anti-competitive. The Greens, for example, have got a policy to instantly increase it to £10. I would love if we could, but I think it would really hurt lots of businesses, and I'm guessing there are some people here who run small businesses as well, who would find, you know, cafes in Rothsey having to pay all their staff £10 as opposed to what they currently pay them. So, there's a process which I think is a good one, where the Low Pay Commission recommend what it should be. What we've said is we need to get to a point where the minimum wage becomes that living wage, the level at which you don't need to claim in-work benefits. It seems to me ridiculous that one arm of government says this is what the minimum wage should be and another arm of gov government, namely the Department of Work and Pensions, says but here's what you actually need to live on and it's higher so we'll give you housing benefit and so on. So our proposal is gradually and sustainably in a way that doesn't threaten businesses that pay it to increase the minimum wage higher so that it reaches that level at which it becomes a living wage. I just think that there are dangers that most parties agree with that if you move too far too fast it becomes unsustainable for everyone and then you have job losses which isn't healthy for the economy either. I, I share your aspiration but I just think that sometimes you know, the road to hell can be paved with good intentions and that we could actually cause more damage by reacting too quickly, too far. But I, I, I do share the aspiration that our, our minimum wage should be a living wage. And uh, what's your take on this, please? I, I think it's, it, it kind of feeds into, I'm sure it will come up later on, so I won't go too much into it, but the, the austerity agenda, which we are all having to, to live in. I spoke with uh, someone this morning on the island who was saying that the biggest problem coming through their advice centre is low pay. Low pay and zero hours contracts, they hurt the poor. Uh, we have seen, I, I say, we'll, I'm sure we'll go on to austerity later, but you know, the, the Trussell Trust today saying that there's a million people in this country reliant on food banks. There is, a, there is an alternative way to run your economy. I think you should run your economy not as an end in itself. Your, co your economy has to be run for the benefit of the citizens of the country. And unfortunately, that's not what, that is not what is happening. So anything that can alleviate low pay, anything that can rid us of zero-hour contracts, we have to do. But it's a political decision and only a complete U-turn on austerity will allow us to do it. Alistair? Well, I uh, run a small business that does pay more than minimum wage, um, and I understand the costs small businesses face. Um, the larger corporations and the big multinationals can actually pay more. The smaller businesses do struggle. We in government have delivered the largest real-term minimum wage increase since 2008. On top of that, and this is what's more important in my opinion, we're lifting so many people out of paying tax. It's the crucial thing. Too many people on lower incomes are paying too much tax, and that has to stop. And we are lifting people out of having to pay tax on lower incomes. On top of that, we support cut in business and corporation tax, which does mean you have more money to employ people. It is better when you run a lower taxed economy, a smaller government economy, for both the workers, the business, and management. Okay, Hala. Well, the, the public sector should be paying the living wage, which is set higher than the minimum wage. So far as the minimum wage is concerned, I don't think it's right for politicians just to, to pick figures, because I think we have to consult with, with the experts in this field. The minimum wage at the moment is set by the Independent Low Pay Commission, and they're, they're tasked with...
sitting at a, a, a level which um, does not uh, be, be too high for small businesses and so th threaten the loss of more jobs. Now, we should be encouraging the Low Pay Commission to set the minimum wage as, as high as it can be but while still being sustainable and not lead to, to lost jobs in the, in the private sector. I don't like because a politician is picking a figure uh, of eight pound out uh, or any other figure out of the air. For, for, uh, an example is the lady who asked the question said um, the inflation could have eroded that uh, value by 2019. We have no idea what the rate of inflation will be between now and 2019. So I don't think it's right to, to pick a figure. But uh, the public sector should be paying the living wage and we should be encouraging the low pay commission to set the minimum wage as, as high as is sustainable. Thank you. A gentleman at the back with the glasses. Oh, Danny boy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening to the, the three major parties, and each one of you are all still interested in keeping the austerity cuts going. Yeah? Um, I listened, strangely enough, to Ian Duncan Smith this morning, and he says that he's going to, he's going to alter that. But what he's going to do is change the name. He's not going to change the policy. He's going to name the bedroom tax the, what is it, the, the extra bedroom supplement. And he's going to name the zero hours contracts, uh, flexible hour contracts. Is that the Tory way of changing things and becoming a bit more progressive? Be keeping the same policy but changing the names of them? That's Alan the Raymond. Deal. Yeah. What I would say sorry, is. Sorry, Alan, that, Red. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, I've been called worse. <laughs> What I would say is that many who preach socialism and anti-austerity agenda themselves don't come from a poorer background like I do. I've said this at a number of hustings. I was campaigning in Loch Gilpad recently, and I found very little taste for, for socialism and big government and all of those things in the schemes. However, I did notice in the leafy suburbs, I bumped into someone that had two cars, a swimming pool being built, and told me they were a communist. Frankly, I didn't believe them. <laughs> you have to pay down the debt. You cannot spend more than you take in in revenue. It is an immoral thing to do. Now, if I live to my full life expectancy, which I hope to do, I will just about see our national debt paid off. It is the greatest form of fiscal child abuse to borrow money that we can't pay back for hundreds of years. We should be passing on a surplus to generations yet unborn, not saddling them with debts for further cuts to happen later on. That is our duty. It should be. You cannot borrow to create growth. You cannot borrow your way out of debt and spend your way out of recession. It does not work. It never does. Much on many people from poorer backgrounds know this. In your own household, if you spend more than you take in, you go bankrupt. And we cannot take the Greek advice of borrowing huge amounts of money, then refuse, refusing to pay back our debts. I'm afraid that's not how we operate. If we want to keep our good credit rating and not see it drop down to junk bond status, we have to see change. We have to see smaller government, and we have to see our debts paid back so that we can talk about how we're going to spend the surplus, not how we're going to pay off the debts. Mary Gilbreth, you indicated you want to speak? Yep, that's fine. Um, what I would say is I've, I've got a lot of sympathy with what the gentleman says in his question, although he tried to lump, the, um, I think, myself in with the other two current coalition parties. No, absolutely not, because what we've said, we have challenged the coalition parties on £12 billion of welfare cuts. They won't tell us what they are. And I think that's utterly unacceptable to go before the, the country in an election and say there will be 12 billion cuts, the biggest cuts in the next two years, but we're not going to tell you what they are, and then it will ramp up. Bigger cuts than we've experienced in the last five years are going to happen in the next two years if the Conservatives and presumably the Lib Dems supporting them again, if required, get in. I think that's not acceptable. 
Our plan that, I'm that I was trying to explain at the beginning is to have more people working, more people doing rewarding work, whose pay is better, whose tax bill is lower, and therefore fewer of them claiming benefits as one of the key means to help restore our economy to the balance that it needs to be where the deficit reduces, where we are borrowing less to fill that gap between the tax revenues and what we spend on public services. The Institute of Fiscal Studies have said that our plans are really quite different because we've got a different and I believe better way of dealing with it, which is to make more, give more people training, support to get into work, to make their pay more rewarding and more secure. And through those means, we actually get the economy working better, the country performing better and everyday households feeling a lot better than they have done over the last five years. Very briefly, the questioner, please. Very briefly. I hear you, you're talking a lot just now about, you, I hear you mentioned about when the SNP want fiscal autonomy, they're talking about a £7.6 billion pound deficit, and they're Is going to have that? to borrow some of this money. You don't Sorry. talk about the £75 billion that you guys are talking about borrowing, but I never hear anything about that. How are you going to sort that, the £75 billion, uh, that you're going to very, borrow? Very, very, quickly. Yeah. very, very quickly. But I didn't mention full fiscal autonomy, Not and I don't I. know the... Si I, sorry, I thought, I, I thought you were accusing me of saying it there, my yeah. mistake. I didn't uh, say either, so I'm kind of confused by the question, frankly. He, d he did say that we mentioned it and we didn't. The seven point six billion pound deficit that we're going to fall into if we go that way. Is that true? Right, well, so no, no, is that true? Yes or no? I want a time. I just want a yeah. yes or no. Well, do you think that the SNP are going to give us a 7.6 billion deficit if we get full fiscal autonomy? Yes or no? Well, so far you're the only person to bring it up after accusing us of bringing it up. <laughs> SNP in the paper or the news. As right. soon as you bring up SNP um, talking about full oh, fiscal so autonomy, nice. he's mentioned the seven point six billion pound right. deficit yeah. that we're going to get. Right. But you, but, but when you, any of you guys are going to we get into government, you're going to have to borrow something about seventy five billion pounds worth of money to keep yeah. things floating. You don't talk about that. Where's the money coming to pay for that? Okay, very briefly and then Alan Reid. Taking the two points in turn. That? Nicola Sturgeon herself has said, as is John Swinney, that the 7.6 billion is real, it's based on the Scottish Government's own figures, and Nicola Sturgeon said last week that borrowing would be one option to look at it. So it's not as if it's a fictional gap in between spending and tax revenues, it exists, and that different means would need to be looked at to fill it. John Swinney said it would take many, many years to get to the point where that gap would be closed, despite the fact that had we voted yes last September, we'd have been independent by March next year in less than 12 months. So the figure is real, and it's how the Scottish Government, uh, the, the current SNP Government would need to explain how that would be done. So that deals with the 76. The other borrowing that happens is something that needs to, in a slowly and structured way, be brought down in the way that I described. So I won't repeat that again, the way about you know, making work pay and so on. Just before you come in, Alan, there's a gentleman who's <laughs> hand up for quite some time. Um, I have a problem uh, with anything Medical Brace says about the economy. Last week, we did balls actually making a statement about the economy for the UK. We had Jim Murphy making a different statement about what's going to happen in Scotland. And your, your Shadow Employment Minister then intervened and said that Jim Murphy doesn't make economy or is not in charge of the budget as far as the Labour Party is concerned. So can you bring some clear clarity to what the Labour Party is about in the economy. Is it Ed Balls, we believe? Is it Jim Murphy, we believe? Where are you at all? Right, we're moving around. Very, very quickly. Right. Where are we? Where are we? Is that Ed Miliband's the leader for the UK? Jim Murphy's the leader for Scotland? From what I read and saw, their, the, their statements were compatible and that, <laughs> you know, Nope. What I do believe is that the press loves to make mischief, loves to photograph Ed Miliband eating baking sandwiches, eating sandwiches. There's all kinds of, there have been years and years of demonization of Ed Miliband. Now that people are getting the chance to see him unfiltered, his ratings are going up because people are seeing the real Ed Miliband. Right. Alan Reid, please. Right, well, the, well the, the question I put my hand up to answer was, was the 7.6 billion. 
Now, the 7.6 billion is the, is the additional deficit every year uh, that, that would happen if the SNP's policy of full fiscal autonomy was put into effect. That's the deficit that the Scottish Parliament would have. It would have a £7.6 billion extra deficit over the existing deficit every year. And because the, the SNP's plans are that I mean, all services other than foreign affairs or defence would be supplied by the Scottish Parliament, then, the, then pensions, benefits, as well as the current uh, health and education would all have to be cut in order to find that extra £7.6 billion. Now, I simply see no point in uh, voting for a party that's going to add uh, £7.6 billion to Scotland's deficit. Because you cannot carry on borrowing forever. We, we inherited in 2010 a massive public deficit as well as a massive national debt. Now, you simply, if, as anybody in their personal life knows, if you've got a budget deficit and your credit card's up to the limit, you just can't keep on borrowing on one credit card to pay off another credit card. That doesn't work. The, bu the budget has to be in balance. Now, we have halved the deficit since we came to power in 2010, and the aim is to half it by, tw is, is to eliminate it altogether by 2018-19, because money spent servicing that deficit on debt interest is just wasted money. Now, there are four different uh, choices here as to how you to go about that. And we anchored the previous government in the centre ground, stopping the Conservatives adopting some of the more extreme policies. We hope to anchor the next government in the centre ground as well. We would borrow less than the Labour Party. We would cut a lot less than the Conservative Party. The £12 billion pounds that Mary uh, tried to attribute to the Coalition is actually the Conservative Party policy. It's not it's ours. Budget. It was, it's in your budget. It was in Danny Alexander's it was, budget. It, it was, Danny Alexander's yellow budget did not include that. That was, that was, a, par, that was a party thing. Well, that time, party. Please. well, did I not get a chance to respond to the heckler? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was probably... I was, the, yeah. The, 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 conserv, the Conservative budget that was put forward to this billion pound, £12 billion pounds worth of welfare cuts in it, the alternative budget put forward by Anna Alexander did not have that £12 billion pounds worth of benefit cuts in it. And our manifesto does not have that £12 billion pounds worth of cuts in it. Thank you. Brendan O'Hara. It seems such a long time since you, you asked the question that there's so much has, has passed under the bridge since then. But if I could go back to your original question about austerity, and Alistair in his answer said that it is immoral not to repay the debt. I don't think that repaying your debt at an arbitrarily arrived at date is a question of morality, it's a question of politics. The morality is what happens, what you choose to do in order to pay that debt or what you choose not to do. And when we have one in four children in Scotland being born into poverty, that's morality, because that's a choice that we take as a society. That's what we deem to be acceptable as a society. When we have 220,000 Scottish children being born who are immediately disadvantaged in health, in education, and in future employment prospects, when we choose to do that, then that's a moral choice. And it was Gandhi who said, that the measure of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable citizens. And that's where we are. That's the choice we've got to take. So, you know, fighting over, you know, austerity and austerity light, that's not the question. The question is, how can you look at the poor and the vulnerable and the sick and the disadvantaged in this country and tell them that it's a question of morality that you cut the deficit by an arbitrarily arrived at date rather than helping those poor families. It's an absolute outrage and it's one of the big, big disgraces of UK politics in the last however many decades you want to choose. What we did in 2010 was we elected a Liberal Democrat not to prop up a Tory government. We elected a Liberal Democrat to stop a Tory government, and we got a Tory government delivered on us in tooth and claw. And we cannot allow that to happen again. And there is an alternative.
There absolutely is an alternative, and it says we, we end the cuts. Yes, if you want to reduce the deficit, which we all do, you reduce it at a slower rate. You, know, you don't reduce it by 2018, 2019. Let's reduce it by no, 2024, 2025. Because that way you can invest in public services. You can get working poor up to a decent living wage. And you can alleviate the scourge of child poverty in this country. So let's not talk about morality in terms of repaying debt. The moral disgrace of this country is that we have working families relying on food banks to see them through the week. We have 220,000 of our children born into poverty and seemingly no way out of it. That's what we should be talking about and that's what austerity does and that's why austerity, whether it's full austerity as proposed by the Conservatives or austerity light as brought through by the other two, then that's what we should be talking about. It has to end and it has to end for the benefit of everyone in society. Take it, it's on the same subject. Two. Uh, it's about a uh, subject which affects everybody in the ground. It's not about the same subject. You want to quit another question? Well, just, if you could just hang on. I don't think we're quite finished with this austerity oh, question yet. I'll come back to you as soon as we are. Anyone from the audience like to say something about how the, the, the governments are going about recovering the if that's the word, the national debt. Yeah. And could I just say, uh, someone earlier on said we don't have enough mics. We don't have the resources of BBC or ITV. <laughs> and uh, we're, work we're working within the confines of the, the system within the pavilion. That's why we only have one roving mic. So if, it, if it's not quite sufficient, I'm sorry about that. But we have to work within the confines of the system we have. Yes. You're actually doing better than the BBC because at least we're hearing uh, different points of view without a whole load of BBC journalists intervening. <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree with um, what Brendan's just said. We've got choices to make and the point about the 7.6 deficit that keeps being flagged about um, in relation to what, what Nicola was debating last week she made the point that uh, we're looking at a, a snapshot in the course of the economy. And there's been lots of debate, very negative debate around the question of oil. The, the reality is, uh, in Scotland, and has been for decades, the price of oil goes up and down. At the moment, it's down. But we don't have uh, any budget like they do in Norway that would have helped us to have get, get us through the lean days. But, but oil was never in the Yes campaign the big issue about a, a forward-looking Scotland. We've got a very vibrant economy in Scotland. And if we've got a commitment from people as the SNP, I, I'm not a member of the SNP, mm. but if we have a commitment uh, to move forward positively, we're looking at renewables, we're looking at small businesses, we're looking at tourism, we're looking at all the other things. Oil was never the big issue. But nevertheless, we still do have, uh, off the west of Shetland, huge oil resources. And if the Tory government had been good enough to actually put some investment into oil, uh, oil production and uh, new, new, uh, new, invest, new investment, then we would have got much further than we have, as it is they've squandered it, as Margaret Thatcher did in the decades before. So what's your solution? So I, I do, I, 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 there's one question uh, I would have for each of the panel members, and that is, most people want a positive view of what's going to happen in Scotland. What's the single thing that each panel member would do to make a better Scotland? I'm not sure if that's relevant in this um, hustings when it's a, a British government we're talking about. It's still like to answer uh, it. Um, I really think you're, you're going into the realms of, of a Scottish uh, election rather than a British election. What was the question you wanted a quick answer to? Uh, what's the single most positive thing we could do 
to, to boost the economy uh, in the UK. I'll start with you, Brenda, very briefly, please. I think you end austerity. You invest in the economy, you invest in people, and you lift people out of poverty. You get people back working, you get people contributing. That's what I would do. Well, our economy right now is growing fast. Wages are up, standards of living are on the rise. Now is not the time to turn around and sign up to a coalition of chaos where you have a Labour government propped up by the SNP. I personally feel that we have the best economic record. We came into power with a massive deficit, huge unemployment, a terrible set of books, and now, do I want to answer the question? I am answering the question. Well, I'm afraid there isn't a limit on how quickly I can answer the question, frankly, so that's. But I personally feel that low taxation, a smaller government, and a more fiscally sound economy is the future. I believe that greater employment and greater apprenticeships, more of them, is a positive thing we could see in our economy, <clears throat> and more local devolution as well. Thank you. Very briefly, please. I think we need to invest in the future generation, in young people, especially for here in Argyll and Butte, where unemployment among young people is high and many of them leave the area. For a sustainable economy here, we need to help them in their education, training, apprenticeships, the future fund I mentioned earlier. We need to help our young people get working, get active, get their skill levels up and, be, and contribute to the economy. I think that's one thing that would really help. Thank you. I would cut income tax for people on low and middle incomes. In the last parliament we cut uh, the tax bill for people on low and middle incomes by £800 a year and cut it by another £400. That gives more money into people's pockets, which they're then spending in the shops and that, uh, spending in shops and other businesses, and that circulates around the economy. I think that's the way to stimulate the economy. Thank you. I think we'll move on. We've been going nearly an hour and we're only starting our third question. Over here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> keeping you, you, keep you, keep you very fit. Mr. McIntyre. Uh, could I, just before um, I ask the question, say that one of the big problems for this island and for our Gail and Butte as a whole has been identified depopulation. Mm -hmm. um, this island has lost, I think, about 900 souls. And since the last census, we're now down below 7,000. Um, what are the panel's views on the way to arrest this? And what particularly do they feel about community buyouts? There was a very successful one in Gear. Um, there's an attempted one straight across the bay there, which hasn't come to anything. So could you have comments from all four? Yes, Alan, as the sitting MP, what would you do about the depopulation of this island? Well, a lot, of, a lot of the powers in that regard are devolved to, to the Scottish Government. In, in terms of the powers of, of the Westminster Government, I think they, one, one of the really important issues is um, Im, improving uh, telecommunications, uh, bringing superfast broadband everywhere and 4G mobile phone coverage. I think that's very important for, for businesses and it's, uh, and it's also very important to encourage uh, people, particularly young people, to, to stay. Uh, we've also had the fuel costs are uh, very high. We've already had the, the, the 5p uh, discount on fuel duty on, uh, on the islands. I would like to see that increased. I would also like to see that um, extended to remoter parts of the mainland. That would, would, would um, make it easier to, easier to carry out uh, business in our island. Uh, sorry, Robert, do you want to come back on that? Well, well that's, devolved, that's devolved to the Scottish Government, and I, I certainly support community buyouts. I supported, uh, I've supported the, uh, several community buyouts, but uh, and a lot of these powers are, um, to stimulate the economy are now devolved to the Scottish Government. So I was asking in terms of the powers that are still at Westminster where um, the, the, the government there can help, but the Scottish Government could do enormously far more to help remote communities, but I, I, mean, I don't want to go down that road because it's a Westminster election. I don't really want to get into um, criticising the Scottish Government. I mean, probably since Mike's, it wouldn't be fair, Mike's in the audience and not able to argue back and happily debate it with him any time, but I don't think that's really appropriate for this particular forum. Thank you. Alistair Redmond, please. Yeah, well, I'm 
a young person from an island that's also seeing depopulation. One of the issues that really affects myself and fellow young people on Isla is lack of housing. Now, it, Alan's entirely right. These, many of these things are devolved, but I would put immense pressure on the council to build more because they're just not building enough. I attended a, a ceremony. It was a rather embarrass, embarrassing ceremony where they were building eight houses in Portellan. And there was this huge, you know, entourage of choir and, you know, cameras there, and the local councillor, Robin Curry, had been dragged away from his house to actually do something. And he was handing over the keys. And I'm thinking, God, I mean, are we going to start handing out medals? You've built eight houses. There are 200 people on my island alone on the house waiting list. It's simply not enough. Now, many of those things are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, it's true. But we do need better broadband. We do need better apprenticeships, more quality paid jobs for young people, people like myself. We need to keep our population on the island. It's not just a case of depopulation. It's a case of a growing elderly population and not enough young people as well. And that has to be addressed. I think you specifically mentioned community, community bias. Take one, you know, take each one on its own individual merits. Again, that's de devolved. But I'd say there are some brilliant community bias. I would perhaps debate a bit about the gear one. Having been over to gear and spoken to many people, opinions split on that. Um, there are some brilliant community bouts, some not so brilliant. Each one has to be judged on its own individual merit. Brendan O'Hara, please. Uh, briefly, on, on community buyouts, I think instinctively you should support the community and where it's feasible and you can do it uh, and you can do it properly. I think absolutely. I think if you look at what's happened at Castle Towered, it's an absolute disgrace why Castle Towered was refused community buyout. Um, and how our Gail and Butte Council can, even on an economic level, look at their books every month and think, well, there's another X thousand pounds uh, securing a, a crumbling ruin, you know, while well, there's a community desperate to get their hands on it. How they can justify it is absolutely bewildering. And yesterday I, I, I visited Rockfield School in Oban, which was uh, a community buyout. And they've got fantastic plans, and the community are absolutely united behind them. So I think where we can support, uh, where we can see a community buyout has local support, we give it our, instinctively, we give it our, our full support. Um, depopulation, I think there's a, there is a huge problem in our Island Butte that we are losing population, and we have an increasingly aging population. What I see as a pattern being that people are leaving Argyland Butte, young people, whether they go to university or college, and they are quite rightly experiencing having high-speed broadband connection. It becomes not a luxury, it becomes a utility. And it's very difficult to therefore to encourage people back to live in Argyland Butte when at the moment it's not there. But what we are doing and what we are seeing is that what by 2016, by March 2016, 85% of Argyland Butte should be covered by high-speed broadband. And by the end of 2017, we should be seeing 95% of Argyland Butte covered by high-speed broadband. So that's a huge incentive to get people back. But I think there also has to be a more of a proactive approach, and I'm being kind from our Island Butte Council, and encouraging people to come here, encouraging people to settle here, open businesses here. I know from my, just anecdotally from my own experience of dealing with our Island Butte Council, uh, something as simple as looking for a planning application for, a, for my house, was, you know, that they have the council that likes to say no. You know, they, they seem to thrive on making it increasingly difficult for individuals and small groups to do things. They seem to have a default position, which is, no, you can't. And I think unless Argyle and Butte Council change that, people won't come here. People will go to areas where there's a council that likes to say yes, or at least likes to be seen to be working in cooperation with the applicant. So there's a whole number of things. I think Transport is, in, is becoming increasingly good within our Gaelic Butte. I know certainly someone who uses it, the rest would be thankful almost day and daily. You know, the fact that it hasn't collapsed this winter is oh. ex exceedingly encouraging. I think we're rolling out high-speed broadband. I think the blocks are there. I think we need our Gaelic Butte Council to be the 
cement that holds those blocks together and then we can start to really turn this place round because there is no reason why somewhere as beautiful as Argyll and Butte and with accessibility to the central belt should be losing population. It just shouldn't be happening. Thank you. Could I, could I just appeal to the, the, the panellists, please, to, to try and be a bit more brief? I know politicians love to talk, but um, we're not getting through the business very quickly if you give long answers to every question. If you could try and be as brief as possible, please. Mary okay. Gilbraith. Uh, a really good question, Robert, and one that I care about passionately coming from Kintyre. It's an issue we've got there as well. Numbers going down. Let me address the different points in turn. Community buyouts, absolutely. I'm really proud of the fact that it was the Labour government initially, uh, back from 97, and then also in the Scottish Parliament that pushed through a lot of the land reform legislation, which was a starter for 10. Still got more work to do, and there's more work being done cross-party. That's great. And that helped a lot of these community buyouts happen. I think, um, yes, anything that can get away this uh, um, often dead hand of centralising bureaucracy from or, or remote control from other places is good and putting communities in, in charge I think has got so many merits to it. We should be looking at how we can make it happen rather than looking for excuses not to. On the other things about, a, about getting young people to stay here, as I said, I think it's about investing in them. It's about giving people who don't want to leave to go to college and university, of whom there are many, other opportunities. We invest thousands of pounds in young people that go and study, but not in young people that go straight to school, working on the farm or anywhere else. And so that's why I'm really encouraged by the, it's one of my favorite, my pet policy, if you like, the 1,600 pound future fund for kids that don't go to university or college. That can be used for driving lessons, for HGV lessons, and I've already had haulage contractors that you'll, you and I both know saying they think it's a great plan because it will go a big way towards those costs. You could use it for offshore survival training. A lot of people dip into their own pockets to pay for these skills that are, help you become more employable. It's a really good scheme and it's basically levelling it up. The ones who don't go to university need that investment as well in becoming employable and getting skills. That's really important. The other big thing I think though is about fundamental structural investment. I look at places like the Western Niles that have had over the last 20, 30 years lots of investment in new causeways, bridges to Scalpay and all the rest of it. I think we've had the Cregan Bridge and and not much else that has really helped to shorten journeys or, or transform. I sometimes wonder if, you know, we were looking 50 years ago, the way we look at things now, we would have just built a faster Erskine ferry rather than an Erskine bridge. What I think we need is transformational infrastructure investment, really big sums that will, that Argyllan Butte hasn't seen. Other parts of Scotland have seen, we've not for a long time. We used to build lots of fixed links and do lots of braver stuff in the past, and I think we need to look at doing that again. One, I believe the only way to do that is for all parts of government to really stop pointing the finger at each other and work together. That means local government, Scottish government, and the UK government collaborating on an integrated plan that will really bring transformational change in our infrastructure, particularly at transport, but in other areas as well. Obviously, the broadband issues and mobile phone signal is important, but to get the wherewithal, the economic tools of transportation and communication in place, that will help people stay here, it will help them come back here, it will help the businesses that are here grow and thrive, because it's jobs, it's fundamentally jobs that we need here in Argyland Butte to stop the population decline continuing. Okay, you, you never mentioned, I don't think, community buyout. That was one of the... I started off with that. I, did, um, I started off with it. That was the first thing I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah she did. <laughs> My opponents are even saying they did. Robert, did, did I answer community buyout enough for you? Thank you. I'll, I'll come and collect my gold star later. See, that, that's a peace breaking out among the candidates that are agreeing with one another. Can't happen very often. Glad to be of service. We'll move on to another question. This gentleman at the very front. I take it it's totally different from the... Yes. Thank you. 
Um, the current coalition introduced uh, PIP, the personal independence payment. As a result of that, thousands of people, <coughs> excuse me, genuinely disabled people were thrown off benefit. Thousands more now can't claim benefit. I want to know which party is going to repeal that legislation and stop demonising disabled people on benefit. Brendan O'Hara, please. How do we stop demonising people on benefits? I, I think you, you start by showing them the respect that they deserve. I think that the idea that... I, I've heard some awful stories recently about Atos disability. In fact, I, I, I bumped into a chap in the street in Oban yesterday who has severe mental illness. He is... Uh, he suffers from severe depression and he was told by Atos that he was cleared to work. Now, I met him at a food bank in Oban and he said that on Christmas Day, had he not been physically restrained, he was committing suicide. It was an awful story. It was an absolutely heartbreaking story. He was at the end of his... And I, agree, I accept that this is an extreme case, but this poor lad, 30 years old, was at the end of his tether and had been told by Atos that his disability uh, living allowance would be cut and that he had, you know, he was fit to return to work. He could not see a future for himself and he was physically restrained from committing suicide. It, it all feeds back into what we're talking about, this austerity agenda, demonising the poor, cutting people off from you know, removing that safety net which any decent society must provide and has to provide and we have taken it away from so many people and it is always the poorest, the most vulnerable and the most ill who will fall through what remains as the squares in the mesh get bigger and bigger and we've got to, we've got to end it. It hasn't worked, it's not working. And how it, how yeah. would you make it work? I, I, as I said throughout, we have to end austerity. We have to stop these cuts, which are designed to hurt the poorest hardest. We have to invest in our economy. We have to invest in public services. We have to, as I was, if you like, make the nets, make the netting and the safety net much, much smaller, so people can't fall through, because that's what's happening, and it's being done to save money, and it is, it's basically, I think, immoral what's happening. To you in a minute. Alan Reid, please. Well, disability benefits are shortly going to be devolved to the, the Scottish Parliament, so uh, it, would, you know, it will be up to, to the Scottish Parliament to uh, de decide uh, the future of disability benefits in Scotland. Uh, no, but to be fair, I don't think that's the question, whether it's well, been devolved. Well, 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 that's our policy. Well, the, the question was, what would you do to improve or, or stop the demeaning, I think it was. Demonising people. Well, on, certainly, demonising certainly, people. Certainly. On. What would you do? That's what the, the audience want to know. Well, we're devolving, well, uh, the policy is to devolve uh, disability benefits to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my, my, my own, my, what, what, what do I hope the Scottish Parliament will do? I hope the Scottish, well, certainly I, I agree that we, we, under no way should we be de, de, demonising uh, people on benefits, um, no matter what benefit they're on. What I hope the Scottish Parliament will do when these benefits are devolved is that it will uh, set up a review, will consult with uh, people with disabilities, consult with people who have experience of the present system, and will have, a, have a, 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 a thorough review and come up with a system that is, is better than the present one, because I, mean, I agree there, there is a lot long, a wrong with, with the present system. I mean, as a local member of Parliament, I I've received a large number of, of, of uh, letters, emails, phone calls, and visits to surgeries from people who have applied for disability benefits. And I mean, I, mean, I agree that there, there is a lot that needs to be reformed about the present system. The I mean, ATOS were given the contract by the uh, previous government in 2008, and they have um, have not performed well. In fact, the contract for employment support allowance was actually. Uh, well, well, they handed it back. They were about to have it taken off them, and they, they handed it back. So I think that is just an indication of the, of the failure of Atos. And there was a huge backlog, which I 
again, myself and other MPs were constantly complaining about it. That backlog has been reduced and the time for the assessments has been speeded up, but a, a lot more needs done. And I certainly hope that the Scottish Parliament will have a thorough, thoroughgoing review when the powers are devolved. Thank you. What do you think of the answers you've heard so far? I suppose what I'm looking for really is a commitment from any of to say that they will actually repeal the legislation on PIP, because that's what's necessary. It's, it's, it's deliberate cruelty to, to disabled people. Deliberate. Well, I, I'm not too sure on this, but the, the feeling I have is this is being devolved to, to the Scottish Parliament, this legislation. Is that right? Yes. So. It won't be for the current, you know, future MPs. I don't, I'm asking the panellists what they would do, so I, I don't think you're really going to get a, a, an answer to what you're... Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to get an answer to that because the, the power is being devolved to Holyrood. But that doesn't stop me asking Mary Gilbraith, what would you do? Yeah, the, I mean, the principles around which the scheme needs to work, you're right, has to be on respect and trust. And, and I agree that in too many categories of people. Sorry, some people are standing up and some people are sitting down. I'm happy to jump no, up and down. No, it's all right. I, I, I should have said it at the beginning, sit down, because the sound system is so exactly. good. Exactly. So I'll, I'll stay seated then. Um, what needs to happen, fundamentally, that the people are respected and involved in the design of the system, because so much of what was done ignored all the basic lessons that we know about how you need to carry out the, these assessments and how you need to involve people. I think the whole system has been completely under-resourced as well, hence there have been backlogs, shortcuts, errors um, that are just nightmarish for the people who have to live through them. And these are people who are not just disabled but are often very vulnerable as well because of their disabilities. So I, I agree it needs wholesale change when it does reach the Scottish Parliament reform involving the people who are affected and, and uh, fundamentally an attitudinal change around, around the policy makers that this isn't um, given begrudgingly, this is the right and it, there needs to be dignity around the way it's done it, that's got to be part and parcel of, of how the whole, the whole package for disabled people of which PIP is a part or its successor needs to be done. Thank you. Alison? Well, I mean, I'd be demonizing myself if I was to demonize poor people. I myself am not from a privileged background. Well, you're laughing, sir. You're laughing. But do you know me? Do you know my background? No, you don't. So I'd rather you'd stop laughing. Thank you. Well, again, I'm giving an answer, but I can respond to hecklers. Thank you. This gentleman's the chair. Um, what I would say is that welfare reform is substantially more popular north of the border than it is south of the border. I support a welfare state that supports ill and sick people. However, we can't pretend like the welfare state can carry on in its current form without any reform whatsoever. So I'm very happy to support welfare reform, as does the majority of people in Scotland, more so than in the rest of the UK. What was that comment earlier? Wait, wait till we got a microphone. Everybody wants to hear what you've got to say. I, ju I just think that that re last response w w was quite shocking. It, it was almost a case of what we're doing is right. I mean, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people suffering needlessly because of a deliberate act of Parliament. Now, to sit back and say that's okay is, is basically <clears throat> from under that. Would you briefly like to say you, well, the, the, the gentleman thinks you've insulted him? I have no intention of insulting you whatsoever. And what I would say is you'll be very soon able to take this issue up with the Scottish Parliament and it'll be devolved to them. There's a lady at the very back with her hand up. Is it to do with this subject? The microphone's just coming in. I'll come to you guys just in a minute. Hey, right, carry on. Um, the gentleman with the blue tie on... Um, you said uh, earlier on in your, your, your spiel about um, taxing or, or taking less tax off poor people. And I was just wondering, I was reading this morning that the Tories 
propose to um, tax people on DLA and cut people who uh, receive carers allowance by 40%. I was just wondering mm -hmm. whether it's devolved to the Scottish Government or not. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I take it you, you uh, must be the Scottish Conservative Party. Uh, do you see that happening in Scotland? And for the rest of the parties, uh, my son's got Down syndrome. He leaves school uh, at the end of May. How are you going to make his future as valued and equal as everybody else's that's leaving school at that time? Again, I've got to show my political ignorance here, and I think that's a, a devolved matter. Well, Education yeah, certainly yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but briefly, how, uh, would, you, how I, would you answer this lady I, who's... I, I support, what would you do to solve her problem? Well, again, I support tax cuts on lower runners, and, of course, I would take each individual case on its own merit. I believe welfare has to be reformed. I believe taxes have to be lower and government has to be smaller. However, many of these things that keep getting brought up at these hustings are devolved or are going to be devolved. Just wait for the mic, please. We can't hear you. The Scottish Conservatives also agree that DLA should be um, taxed then. Is that, well, is I that believe the Scottish whatever, Government? We, I, don't, I don't believe we support any circumstances that increase tax. Many things that are, in fact, cuts are pushed off, put off as tax. For instance, the bedroom, so-called bedroom tax, isn't a tax. It's a decrease in benefits. So things aren't taxed. They're merely benefits being reduced. They're not the same as a tax. be taxed. Is that not just a change of phraseology? No, it's not. It's not. Because, yeah. see, now that's, that's, that's unfair statement to say. A tax is levied on income. A reduction in benefits is what the state gives you less. So the, then it's not a, a, a phrase of phraseology. It is wrong. One, a tax is levied on income. So I'm afraid does the Scottish government, does the Scottish Conservative Party agree with those cuts or reducements or... Um, taxes or whatever label you want to call it, do you still They, 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 they support the reforms, yes. Right, thank you. The lady here has had a hand up for a long time, Douglas. Down the, the microphone's just coming. Is it the same subject? Yes, it's back to the original question about the PIP um, payments and somebody mentioned ATOS. I think there's an elephant in the room here. Everybody's talking about treating the disabled with respect, etc., etc. Nobody could disagree with that. How come companies like ATOS and the new one, Maximus, that's taken it over, can make billions of pounds of profits? What are they making the profits out of? You know, you're cutting disabled people, but you're giving it to private companies who have to make a profit. That's the deal. How would you answer that? Mary? Ultimately, when we use taxpayers' money for the public benefit. There's a mix of how it's spent. Some of it gets spent directly on public sector staff. Some of it is spent with private companies. So, for example, when you need a public building rewired, you're going to go to an electrician. You're not going to have a tax, you know, a public employed, and that electrician will make a profit. Now, that's the way it's been for many, many years. Progressively, you're right, we have shifted to where services that used to be done by the public sector are done by private companies. So administering benefits, for example. And I think that I've, what we don't hear about are the cases where some of these things work okay. So if I look at a non-benefits thing, for example, there's been a private sector doing a lot of work for DVLA and running effectively the process that you can now re renew your tax disc online and all the rest of it. Now, because that one works well, we don't really mind so much, but where there are ones where people are really suffering Exactly. And vulnerable people. You're absolutely right. I think it's highly questionable. It needs to have far more scrutiny. The resourcing sorted out because that's when all the delays crept in. So I, I have massive question marks and would like, personally speaking, a lot less. And I know that my, the, the Labour Party's policy also is to really relook at the, the ones that are out there and haul them back, deal with them, get them performing properly because it's not acceptable that in those areas where vulnerable people, disabled people, have been put through the mill and had to deal with the mistakes and the delays, that's just not on. It's absolutely not on. What, what do you say to these answers? 
So I'll have the microphone. I take the point that it may have worked in other areas, but to even begin to compare the lives of people with severe disabilities with TV licensing, it, it's just a nonsense. No, it's, it's, no you, you made the comparison, and for me, that's not comparable. Okay. I think if anybody, anybody in the room that has been through an ATOS assessment, well, you know, we just realise, I mean, these, these are people that have already had lots of medical people, you know, Absolutely. lots of people with, with, with qualifications and consultants diagnosing them, and then they have to sit, be set and be cross-examined Absolutely, I, <laughs> by somebody from Maximus, and a that, large and an American conglomerate. Yeah. It's not acceptable. It's, it's unacceptable. I mean, the, case, the cases that I've heard about, read about, met people, they're just horrifying. I completely agree. The only point I was trying to distinguish is, is that, you know, across all government, because I thought that's the point you were making, there's always going to be a mix, but you're right. In those areas where people are vulnerable, I just think that it's unacceptable, the level of mistakes and service that's been offered. Is it on the same subject? It is, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's relating to something that Alan Reid said, which was about the uh, devolution of uh, welfare. Now, from what I've been able to pick up, um, people like Citizens Advice Scotland are very concerned because it's actually not a level playing field. I mean, there's not reciprocity in terms of what will come from Westminster and what will be controlled by Holyrood. So, Westminster can make welfare reforms which impact on us here and we basically all they have to do is say we're doing this whereas if we're Holyrood whichever part is in power wants to bring in new welfare legislation they have to get it okayed by uh, by Westminster um, this seems a very very long way from what we were promised back in September and I just wonder what the um, candidates views of that are Alan, I think it was uh, you. Could you answer it briefly, please? Oh. <laughs> that, 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 that's an awful thing to say to a politician, like, uh, Dan. Uh, I'll try. Um, right, the disability benefits are being completely and entirely 100% devolved. Uh, what about the veto? Mr. No, that doesn't apply to, to... No, disability benefits are completely 100% devolved. Em employment legislation remains at Westminster, which means that benefits um, that, 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 that people can apply for if they're unable to find a job, that job, job seekers allowance, for example, employment support allowance, for example, they are remaining at Westminster. What the Smith Commission had, had recommended was that the Scottish uh, Government, Scottish Parliament would have the power to top up any of these benefits. Now, what the proposed legislation says that any proposal to, uh, from the Scottish Government to top up uh, benefits like job seekers allowance, employment support allowance, uh, has to go to the, the UK Government, but cannot, the words of the draft legislation cannot be unreasonably refused. Now, that is not a veto. A veto means that the, the Secretary of State would have complete power to, to veto it. Uh, cannot be unreasonably refused means that the Secretary of State could only uh, veto that if he, had, if he could come up with good grounds which would stand up in court for why the Scottish Government proposals were impractical. I would be actually be surprised if that, um, if that um, unreasonably refused clause was ever used. But that only applies to uh, benefits for um, people uh, who are um, unable to find work. No, it doesn't apply to disability benefits. They are entirely 100% devolved. Thank you. Is, is it on the same subject? I think um, the point being, we're sitting here going to elect or hope to elect an MP for Westminster. Westminster has... The, Westminster is a person who gives out the money to the Scottish Parliament. And although um, the disability and other powers are going to come to the Scottish Parliament, that's a question for next year. We would ask them next year what all these candidates will do. 
Right now, I would like to ask all of the candidates, if whoever gets picked to represent us, will they tell us now that they will not agree and go into the no uh, lobby for any more cuts to public finances and also the Barnett form formula. Because it's those money, that money, that will determine what we do next year when we get when the, all these powers get devolved. We can't do anything about them just now. It's the money that comes to Scotland. And that's what I want to know. Will all of these candidates turn round and say, which I think there's that gentleman there at the beginning wanted to know, will they turn their back on demonising the poor and the sick and support them? Uh, on that. I'm sorry to keep harping on about being brief, but would you support or not support I'll be, I'll, I'll be so brief I won't even stand up. Oh, you don't need to stand up. <laughs> I, absolutely. The, the, one of the main planks of the SNP campaign is to end austerity. And we will put pressure on, hopefully, an incoming minority Labour government, as Nicola said, to keep them honest. You know, we will make sure that they cannot just push through this austerity light that they like to talk. So absolutely, it's no to more austerity and it's absolutely no to any cuts in the Barnett formula. Thank you. Well, Very quickly. Full fiscal autonomy would get rid of the Barnett formula. It would create huge cuts. I'm afraid it would. I mean, when it comes down to it, you want to see more money spent off of the border. Absolutely. On top of that, though, this is the argument I always take here. Where is it being spent in Scotland? Because the Barnett formula was designed for rural Scotland. That's what it came about for, because of the issues facing rural Scotland. I think the yeah. question was, would you support cuts? Would I support cuts? Cuts in the, in the finance coming to Scotland from Westminster. Well, I mean, we have to... I think that was the, the, the question it was asked. Well, you, you said, are you against cuts to the Barnett formula? He wants to get rid of it. <laughs> I can't hear you. Westminster tells us how much we can have. And it's, it's up to the, the government to decide in Scotland what to do with that money. What I'm asking you, as you have the final say at Westminster, can you tell me, will you support any more cuts? I.e., like the 30, the 30, 30 billion pound of cuts that we're going to have, we can't stop, and the other 12 billion that you refuse to tell us where it's going mm -hmm. to come from. Well, right at the start, I said I supported the reforms and I supported paying down our debt. We cannot spend more than we take in tax revenues. So I believe we should have prudent money in this country. I believe that we should have sound money, and we cannot carry on spending money we don't have. I ab oh, sorry. There you go. Absolutely support retaining the Barnett formula. I think it gives us a good deal. It's the principle of from those according to their ability to pay and to those according to their need. And it redistributes across the whole of the UK in a way that I think is, gets Scotland what it deserves. So I absolutely support it. Thank you. Alan? Oh, I want to keep the Barnett formula. Let's make, when we're talking about cuts, let's make no mistake. The party that wants to cut most in Scotland is the SNP because they want to take an extra £7.6 billion pounds a year out of the Scottish Parliament's budget. They want to do that because they want to do away with the Barnett formula. The Barnett formula is generous to Scotland. The SNP want to remove that. They want to, they want to replace that with oil revenues. But if you do a simple a calculation you can work out that costs Scotland £7.6 billion a year. So it's the SNP or the party that are going to cut. And because they also want to devolve things like pensions to the Scottish Parliament, then they're going to have to cut pensions as well. It would be a complete disaster if the SNP's plans for full fiscal autonomy were put into effect. And to answer the question, no, I want to keep the Barnett formula, not go down the road of the SNP and cut £7.6 billion a year out of the Scottish Parliament's budget. Chair, Chair can I just get one minute to respond very quickly to yeah. that outburst? 
Um, there is, it's nice no... to see them getting animated. <laughs> <laughs> The question wasn't on full fiscal autonomy, so forgive me if I answer Mr Reid directly. The idea that Scotland is leaving some kind of fiscal nirvana is uh, nonsense. We have had £600 million, £600 billion pounds of cumulative de uh, deficit in the last five years. What Mr Reid is saying, that if full fiscal autonomy was to have started three weeks ago, then you know, the, 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 the Scottish budget would be in deficit. Now, wh why, you may ask yourself, when a Scottish budget is in deficit, it's called a black hole, but when it's a UK uh, deficit, you know, it's deemed as manageable and acceptable and something entirely normal that every other country in the world has. Now, what we are saying is, and you know, don't take my word for it, you know, the Institute of Financial uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies said that full fiscal autonomy would give more freedom to pursue a different and perhaps better fiscal policy and to undertake the radical, politically challenging reforms that could generate additional growth. So full fiscal autonomy gives us the levers of power. But what's, what we've got to be absolutely clear is that full fiscal autonomy is not on the agenda at this parliamentary, parliamentary election. It's not on the agenda. So why you're shouting about it, I have absolutely no idea. We support the retention of the Barnet formula while Scotland remains within the United Kingdom until such times as we can negotiate a far better deal for Scotland. Is it still on this subject? Is it, is it still on this it's, subject? It's sort of, it's about paying off the debt. Um, I, I was told some months ago that the South Sea bubble debt was finally paid off, and that was from 1720. So if we can wait till se from 1720 till the 21st century, why does it have to be paid off so quickly? I'm sorry, I've got a <laughs> sore throat. But the other thing was um, austerity uh, is, is linked to that. If we don't pay the debt off so quickly, we don't have to have austerity. And we don't have to have sort of cuts. But the other thing which is also linked to that is <clears throat> about the banks. The banks create, helped to create the, the big, the black hole that was a black hole. Um, what has happened to the bankers? I haven't heard of many of them going to jail in this country. Exactly. Yeah. I'll ask the audience that. Should we be jailing the bankers? <laughs> <laughs> no question. <laughs> Wait a minute, you'll get a microphone. Just, just, is it the same? Right. I thought you were going to give us a song, Jerry. Well, uh, later on, Douglas, obviously, if you can pay the money, I can give you the song. This is the thing for me. It's the meticulous confidence of people when they discuss particular things that has struck me today. And, for example, the complete discomfort of people when they were discussing issues to do with disability. Mm. All the candidates were discomforted by that. Yep. And what I would like to see is this. If we are in a position where our politicians are feeling that uncomfortable. It means there's a cultural difficulty. A cultural difficulty means it's hard to understand, and so we have to hold to a party line, and that's difficult for me, and I would like to see this. This is my point. If we were as meticulous in the attention to detail that we paid with what bankers did, instead of people who are vulnerable and, and who, who have disabilities in their community, if we paid that amount of attention to bankers, we would not have had that crisis. Absolutely. Completely agree. What would you like to say about that? Me personally? Yes. Well, I mean, nothing horrifies me more than the excesses of banking culture. It was shocking. Um, do we have an economy that is too dependent on banking? Absolutely. I think we need to go back to making things in this country again. We cannot be a country of rear echelon bureaucracy and technocratic bankers. However, that doesn't mean destroy the banking class. The top 1% in this country pay 27% of the revenues. I'm afraid you cannot build up the poor by tearing down the rich. I was furious with the banking crash and furious with the way some bankers behave, but not all bankers are the same. I would certainly like to see our reforms in the banking sector continued, and that would be a very good result. And do I think we need to rebalance the economy? Absolutely. So that would be my answer.
Alan? Yeah, it was a scandal what the bankers got away with, but the, the underlying problem was the lax banking laws at the time un, under the previous Labour government. Now, we'd, we'd all like to see the bankers punished, but we all, also I believe in the rule of law, and you cannot punish somebody if they did not actually break the law. And the, the rules were so lax that the bankers who allowed this catastrophe to befall us weren't actually breaking the very lax laws at the time. I mean, bankers' bonuses was a scandal. What was happening was bankers were incentivized to make big profits for their bank in the current financial year. They then got a huge bonus. The fact that the bank went bankrupt the following year, there was actually nothing that could be done to claw that bonus back. It was a disgrace. And what the present government have done uh, is tighten up the, the banking rules. We've also tightened up the rules on bonuses so that it, it's now illegal to pay bonuses only for performance in one financial year. The bonus has to be spread over a large number of years, and that means that if the bank uh, fails later on, then the bonus paid in previous years can be clawed back. That is a, a much better structured banking system than we had under the days of the Labour government. Thank you. I would just like to, to ask the panel, the, the very pointed question this gentleman asked was, are you uncomfortable talking about disabled people and the, the benefits that they should receive? Simple question. Are you uncomfortable talking about that? Sorry, I didn't get a chance to answer. The, you had the three of them after Jerry. I know. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, this is supplementary. Okay. Uh, Are you un quick, quickly? No, I, 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 I don't regard myself as uncomfortable. It's a hugely complicated matter, and what, as a candidate, I'm sure the others are the same. What you don't want to do is give a hostage to fortune and basically, you know, make up policy on the hoof. We've got to know so much. I've tried very much to tell you what the SNP would do and where I stand, you know, if you like, on the, the political spectrum. And that's what I try to do. So if I've appeared uncomfortable, then I do apologise, but it's most certainly not being uncomfortable talking about disability. Uh, I think it's just trying to speak around the complexities of it. And what I would say on the, the, the banking issue is that really it's the bankers and the hedge fund managers and the City of, City of London financial institutions, the ones that got us into this mess. But lo and behold, they were the first people to recover. You know, bankers' bonuses and all the rest of it are back at 2007, or heading back towards 2007 pre-crash levels. And the country, you know, it's you and I, who have paid for it, and particularly those who have paid for it have been the poor, the sick, and the vulnerable. And it goes back to what I've been saying all along, that it's morally wrong. And I heard Nick Clegg on the radio uh, last Sunday saying that in the next five years, it will be the rich who will share the burden, as if that's some kind of eureka moment for them. As if, what, why haven't the rich been shouldering their fair share of the burden for the past five years? Thank you. If you would just stick to my question, please, are you comfortable or uncomfortable talking about disabled people? Oh, I'm comfortable talking about disabled people. I think that each individual case has to be looked at. Um, and I also believe that there is perhaps no one in this room who doesn't have someone in their family who is disabled. I know I do. Uh, so it's certainly something where many cases might be upsetting, and we don't want to see we don't want to seem bullshy and argumentative and angry about it. We want to be delicate around what is a very sensitive and understandably sensitive issue. Yeah. The, the question is, are you comfortable or uncomfortable talking about disabled people? Absolutely comfortable, but one of the problems is that every disabled person's needs are quite different, and yet we have monstrous institutions legislating for them. And then the legislation is passed down through different arms of government. You have health service, you have social work, you have um, the DWP themselves, you often have other third party voluntary sector people involved and therefore the way in which an individual disabled person gets the right services is this alchemy of PIP, of DLA, of carers allowance, of other and all the other agencies involved and it does feel and, and I know so many people family members as well who have to wade through this minefield and it is a nightmare there are people in this room I know whose job it is to to wade through this minefield and so as a candidate you're saying right we know that there are all these problems I've come across so many cases what are we saying you know how are we trying to improve it because I'm guessing everyone here would love if it worked better 
but it doesn't. But you actually put your finger on it, actually, is that it, to really get this right will take a heroic bit, because it is complex, it's difficult, and we've all got experience of well-intentioned politicians not getting it right and just reforming the whole system, thinking that that will miraculously cure it. But if we put the same energy and effort and application into saying, OK, it's tough, but we're all clever people, we're committed people, let's take on that tough challenge and get it right, get it personalised, get the collaborative working, get the right attitudes involved, then it could be so much better an experience than we know it's often the experience for so many people. So I, I, I think your challenge to us is a good one, which is to say, for whichever of us is ultimately in power, to put the same energy as if you were, you know, um, launching some incredible military operation or un 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 you know, to try and re-regulate the banks or, or transform our export pro prospects, we should be putting that heroic type of effort into getting a service that really works for disabled people because that's fundamentally important to a civilised society. Thank you. Alan, are you, are you comfortable talking about the disabled? Well, I'm comfortable uh, talking about uh, disabilities and people with disabilities. Where I where I become uncomfortable is trying to put a, a monetary value on a benefit because I mean, I mean let's, we, we all know that I mean, everybody who has a disability would much rather not have that disability and not have, have the benefit. But trying to put a, a, a monetary value on what the level of PIP sh we should be, what the level of DLA should be, that is a, is a very difficult subject. And that's where I, I, I find it uncomfortable tr trying, as a legislator, trying to decide what that particular uh, value could be because nothing can compensate, uh, you know, nothing can adequately compensate for disabilities. We'd all rather uh, have all our faculties and, 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 and not the benefit. But so I that, think that, that's where the discomfort arises is putting the monetary value on the benefit. Thank you. You were saying you didn't get a chance to answer the original question. Are you quite happy with the well, chance I think you got I'm, Yeah, I th I th as long as the questioner's happy. Are you happy with what you've heard? Yeah, you were. You asked the question. Yeah. No, I, I think I think I, I'm, I'm heartened by what I, I heard, as opposed to what I had intuitively picked up from people. But you could still see people's discomfort, and I think the key discomfort is, is because it's about answers, but it's fundamentally about people and where we place our things of importance. Yeah, where we place. If we are going to talk about the morality of particular things, but not talk about the morality of punishing people, and, and Alan used the phrase there, he, he talked about, um, uh, he, he used the term punishment, and it seems to me that the vulnerable and disabled people in particular are consistently and regularly punished for a whole variety of fiscal reasons, which seem to me to have little bearing on their well-being, but to have a lot of bearing on the positions of other people who, who maybe are a wee bit uncomfortable with that. So I'm heartened that you answered the question, but I'm still in a position where I feel that uh, disabled people get a rough deal, and it's difficult to talk about that because I think personally, politicians know they get a rough deal, but they're not gutsy enough to come forward and actually take a stand on their behalf. Thank you for that. very much from the heart. Um, I, th I think what that indicates to me, and I'm sure to you, is that whoever wins the, the, the vote on the 7th of May have got um, work to do on disability allowances and the treatment of people who have disabilities. I think we'll move on. We've been talking for quite some considerable time on that. You've already had a question. Is this on the same subject or a new subject? Totally different subject. Totally different subject. Here's the microphone. Hello, candidates. Um, I want to move the debate on to the vow and the future of Scotland in terms of new powers. And I wanted to ask each of you, would you implement all of the recommendations of the Smith Commission or would you be willing to go further and actually devolve more powers from Westminster to Holyrood in order for Scotland to take more control on the affairs that are currently reserved in Westminster? That's almost a question, would you vote for independence? <laughs> <laughs> Mary, would you go first on that one? Okay. 
I think it's important to honour the process that all five parties in Scotland went through. SNP, Greens, Lib Dems, Labour and Tories went through a process where they each had representatives, they each consulted their parties and, and they went through a structured process and reached agreement. And as any, anybody who ever does any negotiation, whether it's in business or with colleagues or with children knows, if you take, if you remove one part or try to add in another part, people just want to reopen the whole deal again. So while any individual party might want to tinker with it, I think the integrity of it is important and that really the only basis on which you could un unlock it, if you like, and add more or take away would be if you could get all five parties who signed up to it to agree. So that would be my principled stance and it's, it leaves aside my own personal views on it, but I think that we owe it to the people and the parties who in good faith negotiated it to deliver and to give it a chance to mature and deliver the benefits that they all perceived we would get. And all five parties agreed that these were going to be good for Scotland and I think we should give them a chance to prove themselves. Brendan O'Hara, please. Um, I, I, I think, like, let's be absolutely clear, the, the proposals put forward to the Smith Commission are not the vow. The vow that we were we had thrust on us in the last few days of the campaign in September as what Gordon Brown described it, a sharing of sovereignty and that the UK would be a federal state within two years. The vow goes absolutely nowhere near delivering what was, del what was promised, I say, in those last few days of the campaign. But as I said at the beginning, this isn't a rerun of the referendum. We are not rerunning the referendum. But we have to make sure that what Scotland voted for is delivered. And that isn't what's currently in the Smith Commission. We have to go much, much, much further. If, we become a, if Gordon Brown was genuine, if when Nick Clegg and uh, Ed Miliband and David Cameron signed the front page of the Daily Record, if they were genuine, then they cannot look at the Smith Commission and say that is what we meant. It is, the Smith Commission is the lowest common denominator. It is the least they could possibly think they could get away with. And if the Smith Commission were indeed the settled will of the Scottish people, then the membership of the Scottish National Party wouldn't be sitting at around 110,000. And the Scottish National Party wouldn't be sitting at 52% in the latest opinion poll. The Scottish people demand substantial new powers to the Scottish Parliament as were promised. And I would, I think it'd be woe betide the British government who tried to stand in the way of the Scottish people and their democratic will to see those powers delivered in full. And the only way we can get them delivered in full is to have as many SNP MPs in Westminster holding their feet to the fire, ensuring that there's no backsliding on what we were promised in September. Alistair Redman. Well, I fully support the devolution set out in the Smith Commission. What I would add on devolution is that where does the devolution stop? I personally don't see giving amounts of power to just Edinburgh as a great thing. I'm an Argyle man, and I have seen a centralizing technocracy in Edinburgh, power hungry. We have seen our police service centralized, our fire service centralized, our health service centralized to the highlands. How's that working out? I personally feel there has to be local devolution. Yes, I support devolution to Edinburgh and the Smith Commission, but from there, there needs to be devolution across Scotland to local authorities and local areas, because Scotland is a very we have Glasgow, which is very different from Edinburgh. Edinburgh, hugely different from Aberdeen. The border is different from the Highlands. Argyle has its own needs. And too much power in the Scottish Parliament is in the centre. And once again, we are sidelined in rural Scotland. So I would want to see local devolution as well. Thank you. Alan? Well, I support the Smith Commission. 
all five parties in Scotland who are represented in the Scottish Parliament signed up to the Smith Commission. I'm horrified to hear what Brendan's saying because John Swinney's signature on behalf of the SNP is on the Smith Agreement. So I, I, I believe that we should stick, when we sign agreements, we should stick to them. So the SNP should stick to the Smith Agreement. As far as this next Parliament is concerned, what is in our manifesto is to deliver the Smith Agreement. We should deliver the Smith Agreement, and then once the Smith powers have been devolved, that's the point when we can have another public debate in Scotland about whether we need to devolve more powers. But for the, this current Parliament, we should be devolving the Smith Agreement. And Alistair was perfectly correct to point out that in the Smith Agreement, there is also a commitment given by the Scottish Government for more devolution within Scotland. We haven't seen any of that yet. I hope that we will see more devolution to communities throughout Scotland, particularly to an island like Butte, because the Scottish Government has been talking to the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland about devolving powers to them, but their Butte and their Gail Islands seem to be left out of that process. So I want to see the Scottish Government devolve powers within Scotland and the UK Government whoever is the next UK government to deliver the Smith Agreement, which was signed up to by all parties, including the SNP. You've heard the full answer. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say, in my own partisan opinion, I was disappointed by the outcome of the Smith Commission. I don't think it was ambitious enough for the country, especially after the context of the fact that we've had two years to debate about the whole fundamental future of our country. Now, of course, Scotland voted no. Um, yes. Personally, I didn't, but we all accept the outcome of the vote and we've got to live by it. But I also do feel that when the Smith Commission proposals were unveiled in November, there was a feeling of disappointment from many people in the sense that it only recommended devolving new powers in certain areas and not in a wider range of areas. And that's really my concern because although I have no, I have no doubt that everybody has the right intention to give more power to Edinburgh, I do also feel that we're not going far enough and we've, it's almost like an anticlimax to a very gripping movie in a sense because suddenly after all the drama and the hype then suddenly the ending is a bit flat. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but that's yes. just the way I see it. Yeah, yeah. I can understand. But that's the way the people voted, is it not? Yeah, public voted now, and we must never forget that. And John Swinney put his signature on the document on exactly. behalf of the SNP. Right. Yep. Nobody made him. Nope. I mean, the, but I think it's important to recognise that, you know, the country was divided 55-45 roughly, and so for 45% of the people, it feels tough. And if I was in the 45%, I would feel pretty cheesed off as well. And I think that what we didn't spend enough time doing was just recognising the fact, whatever the outcome had been, that nearly half the country was going to be pretty disappointed. And we all care passionately about the place. We all want the best for it. We just had different ideas about how to achieve that. And so it's how we therefore can say, right, to use that awful phrase, apologies, we are where we are. Um, but, you know, we've got the situation that we're in, and we just now, I believe, need to say places like Butte, places like Argyll and Butte are great. Let's just work with the powers we have, with the people we have, who are pretty amazing, and, and, and do the best we can and improve our lot in some of the ways we've all been discussing to deal with the problems that, you know, have been raised, like depopulation and so on. Let's get on and do it. Okay. Well, folks, we've been going for almost two hours. Um, I'll take a, a democratic vote in this week. We, we can go on for a wee while longer if you wish, or we can stop while we're ahead. We, we, do, do, you want to, do you want to go on for some more, another quarter an hour? Is that, is that a general consensus, another quarter an hour? Is it uh, totally different? Hello, um, I'm going to ask a very brief question, and as we've only got a few minutes left, a really brief answer, please. Um, what are your views on renewing Trident? Um, I think, Alistair, I'll come to you for that. Fantastic. I am proud to support Trident and its renewal. You have to look at this argument that there is a peace camp 
outside the Faz Lane naval base. And I say the real peace camp is Faz Lane itself. It has ensured peace. It has ensured not another world war. I would say that any country wanting to disarm itself in these uncertain times, with Putin, who I don't admire, by the way, annexing Crimea and annexing Ukraine, parts of Ukraine, with his thugs, I believe that we live in uncertain times. Look at the situation in the Middle East with ISIS. We have to have a nuclear deterrent. It's a stabilizing factor, and it is keeping Putin at bay. Ukraine got rid of their nuclear weapons, and their sovereignty has been invaded. Okay, thank you. Mary? I fundamentally want to see a world free of nuclear weapons. I think how we get there is really important. And the reason that I support multilateral disarmament is that rather than us getting rid of our approximately 225 weapons, a multilateral approach would say that somebody else would get rid of an approximate similar number. In other words, multilateral negotiations give you double the bang for your buck. And that I believe that while the world isn't stable, having a deterrent is a good thing. But that at the same time, we need to put our backs as, you know, in, into those other areas that we may be reluctant to do, like tackling difficult stuff like disability. We've got to get on and tackle disarmament with the same vigour that we tackle some other issues. And the last Labour government did sign up for the Global Zero programme, which was to say we need to get to a point where no country, and there are only nine who hold nuclear we weapons, three of them are in NATO, six of them aren't. Personally, I think that we need to get A, the number of countries down and the number of weapons down, and we do that on a negotiated basis. Negotiations can be successful. We have succeeded in the past on chemical weapons, biological weapons and on landmines to get international agreements to either eliminate or reduce their use. We've done it with weapons that have never once been used. Back in the 1800s, exploding bullets were written out of ever being used in the battlefield in a St. Petersburg agreement between the major powers. So it is within our wits to, to agree through negotiation not to use some of these dangerous weapons that we have invented. We need to do the same with ones that we have invented and get to the point where we don't have any. Thank you. Um, Alan Reid, please. What, what we must be the ultimate aim must be to negotiate worldwide nuclear disarmament. But un until we can achieve that, then while others and the, the, the threats that we cannot foresee yet, where others may be able to threaten us with nuclear weapons, then I think we should keep our own. We, the, the reference is often made to renewing Trident, but it should important to point out that uh, it's not actually Trident that we're renewing, because Trident is, the, is a missile. It's actually the decision that we take and have to be taken next year is whether or not to replace the Vanguard submarines. That's the, the four submarines that carry the Trident missiles. So in, in the absence of any uh, progress towards negotiating worldwide nuclear disarmament, then if I was your MP in the next parliament, when that vote comes in 2016, I would vote to replace the four submarines because these submarines will last until about 50 years in the future. We have no way of forecasting what threats we may face during those 50 years. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 1965, and in 1965, you would never have predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, the complete disintegration of large parts of the Middle East. So because of the, as long as nuclear weapons are possessed by others and there are uncertain threats, then I think we need to have a deterrent ourselves. Now, now, cost is often mentioned as a reason for not renewing Trident, but the, the, not renewing the, uh, not re Vanguard. the, rebuilding the Vanguard submarines. But uh, the whole Trident package will cost Scotland about 200 million pounds a year over the next 50 years. Now, bearing in mind that the SNP proposal is to cut 7.6 billion pounds out of the Scottish budget, we can put this 200, is to put this, put this 200 pounds in context, 200 million pounds in context, we, the SNP often offer it up as a saving, but that saving would only reduce the 7.6 billion to 7.4 billion. 
def the deficit would only go down from 7.6 billion to 7.4 billion. So I think that gets the cost of Trident in context, and I think it is worth the money in order to have a de deterrent to deter others who may have nuclear weapons in the future from attacking us. Brennan? Uh, let me be absolutely clear that if I am your MP, there is no way on earth I would ever vote to support the renewal of the Trident missile submarines. There is no moral, there is no economic, and there is no military case for renewing Trident. And Mary, I don't see how we can talk peace while arming ourselves to the teeth. We can't, it's, it's, it, to me, it's absolutely illogical. And if you want the context of what £100,000 million pounds is, this year, Comic Relief celebrated its 30th birthday. And it celebrated its 30th birthday by announcing that it, over that 30 years, it had raised £1 billion pounds for good causes. Comic Relief would have to raise funds for 3,000 years in order to pay for Trident. It's an obscenity, a moral obscenity and economic insanity. And it's, what makes it even worse is that our conventional forces are being cut to the bone. Militarily, we are not in a position to defend ourselves. We are bristling with nuclear weapons, bristling with weapons that could wipe out the entire world. But what it can't do, we can't even detect when a Russian submarine snags a trawler off the west coast of Scotland. They think it was a Russian submarine, but because we've got no naval reconnaissance planes, we don't know. And that was just six weeks ago. So it's all very well saying that, you know, Putin invaded uh, the, the Ukraine. They are sailing in Scottish or, or UK ter territorial waters, undetected and unchallenged, because we are putting every penny into weapons that can never and must never and will never be used. As I say, moral obscenity, I will oppose Trident till the day I die. And as your MP, I will never, ever support the renewal of the Trident uh, missile system. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, like everything, football matches and tennis matches and all sorts of other things come to an end, so has this. Hustings meeting. Could I just thank the panel? Um, it's quite daunting sitting here as the chairman, um, <laughs> looking out at this audience. Uh, how these people. Well, they're all friendly faces to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I always admire how politicians, of ever hue, how they can talk and answer questions that they have no idea what's coming. Well, they must have a kind of an idea of what's coming to them. But they've spent the last two hours answering your questions, and I, I think answering them reasonably well. You might not agree with them, but that's part of democracy. Um, I would like to thank the panelists. I would like to thank the audience for coming. I would like to thank you for your questions. I would also like to thank the pavilion staff for um, making us the pavilion available and assisting us. Craig Borland of the Butman, who sponsored the hustings. And, uh, Gordon Gillespie, who's in the squawk box at the back, who's um, donated his own equipment um, for this hustings this afternoon. All the equipment that you see that we're wearing, the microphones and all that has been donated, and he's donated his time. So has Douglas Lyle, who's been with the roving mic. I think he's done quite a job. He's lost probably half a stone <laughs> running about the pavilion this afternoon. Um, I don't think there's anyone else. Well, thank you, Dan. yourself, Dan. I think yeah. you've had the most difficult job in the room, so thank <laughs> you to you as well. Anyway, it remains for me to say have a safe journey home and vote for the candi candidate on the 7th of May that you think is worthy of your support. Um, thank you once again for coming this afternoon on such a nice day and, as I say, a safe journey home. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you should also give a nice round of applause to Dan for cheering and keeping the meeting in order. Mr. Dan Edgar.
I, sh I should also mention uh, the TV man, I forgot, David McDowell of um, Democracy TV, who's been sitting there listening to all this and recording it. Uh, not recording it, but putting it out live on the internet. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, hold on.